All right. Uh, it's about 11 after, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody to Show Ohio. My name is Matthew Ayers. I am the event lead for this event. And today we are going to hear from our top five projects and companies live this or live this hour in five minute pitch sessions, followed by three minutes for Q&A after each presentation. Um, that will actually come later in the event. Uh, for now, we are actually going to have a panel discussion with uh, some panelists from uh, various startups that we uh, have talked to in the Columbus community. Um, so I will pass it off to Julia to welcome them. Good evening and thank you everyone. I would say welcome Columbus, but I know we have people from Texas and California, Seattle, the East Coast, and I hear New Zealand. So welcome everybody. And thank you to the first event of Show Ohio 2021. We have Arnab Nandi from MobyKit, Grant Schneider from Upstart, our new Dean of Engineering, Ayanna Howard, and Cheryl Turnbull of the Keenan Center for Entrepreneurship. She will be hosting this short Q&A panel session. So Cheryl, I turn it over to you. There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're excited to have you with us. Um, I'm responsible for the Keenan Center for Entrepreneurship, which supports faculty, staff, students, and alumni startups with resources such as capital, programming, and mentorship. So delighted to have you here. And I have to say, I'm very excited about our panelists here tonight. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna have each of our panelists introduce themselves, but I'm gonna start off with Dr. Arnab Nandi, a, a distinguished faculty member who has, uh, who uh, took a entrepreneurial sabbatical in order to start his own company, MobyKit. Arnab, if you wouldn't mind just spending a few minutes introducing yourself. Sure, um, I'm Arnab. I uh, like to work on large data and uh, I like to build software that helps humans interact with data better and faster. Um, I've also uh, done a few things in uh, the last few years in, uh, at um, Ohio State, including uh, being one of the co-founders of um, OHIO, which uh, I'm so very happy to see uh, it thriving uh, under um, you know, this amazing team uh, that is putting it to together right now. Um, and uh, MobyKit was uh, a multi-year project at uh, Ohio State in the area of spatio-temporal analytics, so uh, data that has uh, location and time components, and then we spun it out uh, into the area of essentially connected vehicles where we were able to build out a stack, and so it's a kit for mobility data, and that's what the startup was about. Thanks, Arnab. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Grant Schneider, who um, I didn't realize is also Dr. Grant Schneider. I guess I should have figured that out because Grant has multiple degrees. He spent a long time at Ohio State. Uh, we're super glad to count him as an alum, and the fact that he joined Upstart and then brought Upstart back to Columbus, Ohio, we're just so proud. So Grant, if you wouldn't mind spending a few moments um, talking, uh, introducing yourself and um, what you do at Upstart. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. Um, and, and thank you all for, for coming and, and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so as Cheryl mentioned, um, I think outside of being an employee of the university, I probably spent as much time as, as one possibly could at Ohio State. Um, so I think between um, getting a few minors and, and um, uh, grad school and ultimately doing a PhD, I think I had spent 10 years um, at, at Ohio State. Um, uh, very much not the plan when I started, but um, just loved it too much. Um, you know, after getting the PhD, they kind of said, okay, well, uh, we don't have any more degrees, like you got to get out of here and go get a job. Um, so when it was time to go get a job, I, I started looking at, um, you know, various opportunities and um, uh, various places where I could apply some knowledge of statistics and computer science and, and so on. And um, uh, had settled on a, a kind of traditional-ish job doing uh, modeling at a, a finance company, was going to go to Washington, D.C. to um, kind of support my wife, who also has a stats PhD. Um, and we were going to go out there, and, and I was going to have a job that paid the bills while she chased uh, uh, the job that she liked. 
I read about this startup called Upstart uh, that, that really blew me away in terms of the mission and the problem they were trying to solve. Um, so essentially trying to close the gap between um, the uh, very small number of people who have access to affordable credit and uh, the, the much larger group of people who have never um, uh, you know, had any problems uh, with credit, been late or, or defaulted. Um, using kind of modern uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, long story short, I, I sent them a cold email. They responded, luckily I flew out there, was blown away by the team. Uh, my wife and I dropped everything, packed up the car, went out to Silicon Valley, loved it, great place to start a career. Um, started to realize that if I wanted to have kids and a house and all the stuff that, that I now want to have as a, a slightly older uh, a man, uh, it was gonna be hard to do in the Bay Area. Uh, started uh, scheming on how to do that and had the opportunity to come back here to Columbus and start up our second headquarters in 2019. Uh, si since then, we've grown to, I, I think by last count, a little over 300 people here. Well, not here in the short north, but over there in the short north when we're actually in the office. So super excited to be here. Always love the chance to do anything OSU related. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, Grant, and so so happy to have you with us. It's just um, it, it's fabulous what the Columbus ecosystem is doing, and truly, sort of um, topping that all off is Dr. Ayana Howard. We are so pleased to welcome her as our new Dean of Engineering, and fresh off of her debut on the View, we are super um, excited to welcome Dr. Howard. If you wouldn't mind spending a few minutes introducing yourself. Yeah, so um, just a couple of stories around entrepreneurship, which I, I believe in wholeheartedly. Um, so I actually sold my first uh, artificial intelligence software packet as a grad student in, in 1996. So that tells you how old I am and how long I've been doing this. Um, I currently have a startup still. Um, it's called Zyrobotics. It's a system technology slash ed tech company that focuses on uh, children with special needs. So three years old to seven years old. So using engineering know-how to um, really lean into the, the, what I would say, the disadvantaged communities, um, basically giving back is, is what I'm doing with that. Um, so that was founded in 2013. Uh, it's housed in Atlanta though, uh, not in Columbus, but you know, with Grant, maybe we, we will be uh, prompted to, to move it. Um, but that's kind of what I've done in the, in the entrepreneurial space. Um, and so I think it's important as engineers, computer scientists, data analytics, uh, data scientists to, to really think about entrepreneurship and the role that we have as developers, designers, and technologists to, to really make a difference and an impact in that space. Great, thank you so very much. Um, you know, you've all been so incredibly successful that as we look at this, um, you know, this, is there, you know, we think that the journey for entrepreneurship is kind of into creating a six, successful startup, it, you know, is linear. Um, but as you live it, you know that it's not, it looks more like a roller coaster. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start with Grant. Um, what do you wish you had done differently or sooner when you first started off? Yeah, great question. Um, and my first instinct is to answer something like, I wish I'd written down more things or, or documented more, more stuff. Um, you know, as, as the company has grown from 20 people to, to 700 or, or whatever it is today, um, I, I still, to a surprising extent, find, find myself um, needing to dig through old emails and, and just like shore up our, our documentation um, from, from the simpler times. Um, but but upon a uh, you know, reflection a little bit, I think um, that that answer suffers a bit from survivorship bias. Where um, you know, with retrospect, knowing we made it and we came out the other side, it's very easy to say like, oh yeah, we should have done this differently and spent more time. We, sh we should have focused more on quality than, than speed and so on. Um, and, and so I think the important thing to note here is just like. Um, uh, you know, you, the students should, uh, any, anything I or, 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 you know, people like me standing up here in front of you say, like, take it with a bit of grain of salt. Like, um, you know, anytime someone's made it through that, it, it's what worked for them. And, and um, that may or may not be applicable. Um, so, so always be skeptical, especially of my answers. Um, may, maybe not uh, the co-panelists, they, they seem much more uh, esteemed and, and capable of answering these questions. That being said, uh, what I wish I would have done uh, differently when starting out was, being less afraid of, of being wrong, I think. Um, so at various points in my life, career, education, so on, um, I 
implicitly assumed or, or expected that I, I, I guess I would have never said out loud that I, I knew it all, but I, I think I, I sort of expected like, oh, I, I've got this PhD or, or uh, I'm boss of, of this like team or, or whatever that like I, I needed to have all the answers. And I think some of that was was suffering from imposter syndrome and, and just fear and, and not knowing uh, that it's okay to, to be wrong and to be learning. And, and I think some of the success that we've had um, at, at Upstart is um, hiring people, you know, smarter, better than myself and, and just getting out of their way and, and uh, enabling them to do that. So, so I wish sooner on I would have leaned into what I didn't know and, and um, just embrace that and, and taking it as an opportunity to either like fill gaps of my own or make mistakes and, and learn things and, and so on. And so it took a little while to build that confidence and, and really embrace mistakes rather than kind of shying away from them and, and expecting too much myself. Arnab, did you know everything when you first started off? Nothing, honestly. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's, it's, uh, I actually really also loved um, that, you know, as we have a stats PhD to remind us of uh, bias, uh, <laughs> something bias, and partial bias, um, you know, um, it is very true. Essentially, any commencement talk that you listen to is, you know, the very few people uh, who tell you to live their dream and all of those things, right? And it's essentially the sample size of you know, five, right? Um, but but that being said, 100% um, agree with, you know, and I want to build on what Grant said, a lot of projects that we don't see in the world right now are the ones that are in the minds of somebody who is just thinking, if only, if only I had some more time, or, you know, maybe I'll do it at some point when I am ready, um, or when when the time is right. And to be honest, there's so much waiting, which I would simply say, the waiting is 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 the critical uh, issue, and so one of the things is in terms of what I wish I had done sooner was to have done this sooner, um, and uh, instead of waiting for multiple years, saying, you know, we we built it out as open source, we put it out there, and so on, instead of actually saying let's just jump in with both feet and actually build out a proper company, and um, and that was something that I wish I had done sooner was to actually start the company sooner or start the project sooner as well, because we I was seeing the pain and and, uh, um, and the need. And so this was uh, that was definitely something that uh, I would have done differently was to start sooner and, and to start it ASAP. So I'm going to go a little off script here, Dr. Howard, I apologize. But you know, Arnab, a re big reason why um, you didn't start it sooner was because you were going after tenure, right? Yes. And you know, sometimes there are uh, students that you really want to work with and you know, wait for them to graduate. Um, you know, one of the hidden secrets is that a lot of the people that, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit about planets aligning as well. And so, mm -hmm. um, and so getting for the students to, uh, to wait to graduate mm -hmm. and then, you know, they're, they're ready to actually jump in and so on. So yeah, one of the hidden secrets is that a lot of the mobile kid employees were, you know, hack Ohio rock stars, right. And, and so That's I was waiting right. for them to um, actually, uh, graduate as well. But yes, uh, faculty led startups are an interesting beast because um, there is another double life that I have to lead on the other side. And so that is, uh, that is its own, uh, own set of challenges. And so you kind of have to think of the, the you know, the, uh, the, the, the Bruce Wayne Batman type situation where, you know, you have to get tenure and also think of this one at the same time. Um, so it is impossible to do both uh, well at once. And I'm a firm believer in sort of doubling down on one thing and doing it well. So there's a little bit of timing that we had to set up over there as well. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Howard, you've done so much and accomplished so much in your career. You have your own startup. You inspire people and students every single day. How do you take like the lessons from what you've done and what you've learned, as well as the lessons that we hear from like um, Arnab and Grant and Emre and like all the, the folks that in our engineering ecosystem and how do you take that and inspire them to take the incredible technology that they're developing out to the world? Um, so kind of building on what was said um, is you have to be okay with knowing that you are going to quote unquote fail. Um, so I think a lot of times as, as engineers, we want the perfect product. You know, we want to get down to the 99.9999% accuracy before we share it with the world. Um, and even if we get it to that point, it will fail because, you know, they, they say no actual product can survive first contact with people. Um, and, and that's the truth. 
Yes. And, and so, you know, working with students is really teaching and training them to be okay with the fact that it's not going to work the first time, like a hundred percent guarantee. Um, and, and it's not a failure because you're going to be learning from it. And so teaching students that when you're out there, look to see why it didn't. So ask the questions. And if someone is doing something that you didn't anticipate, ask, oh, wait, I didn't model that behavior. Like explain that to me. And so basically be a student to the customer and you learn and you iterate, uh, which is one, as an educator, then they also apply that in their classroom, right? So they're, they, they're okay with taking risks in terms of senior design and, and those aspects. So it's, it's a transition, it's a different way of thinking, but I think most companies uh, kind of know, doesn't survive first contact, uh, that their very first prototype alpha beta product that's deployed. Thanks. And, you know, I'm going to stick with you because that sort of leads to our next question, which is, um, so one of our, our, our questions that was posed to us is how do you get past that prototype stage and start to make a polished product? Well, because when they do, because when the folks who are involved in hackathons start, it's, it's just really rudimentary. And people talk about having a minimally viable product. How do you get over like when do you more from that minimally viable product? When do you bring it out to the marketplace? How perfect does it need to be? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it really depends on if it's software or hardware. But one of the nice things about even, I'll talk about hardware because hardware is harder, um, is there are so many um, resources that are out there that allow you to do things that look like a finished product at low counts, right? So like maybe you're only making 10 versus 1,000. Um, everything from, you know, prototyping a, a board to um, doing it plastics and design. And now it's going to cost you a little bit more, but allows you to test things out at low yield. And as, and as a student, it's fairly straightforward to use a lot of these tools um, and, and put forward something that looks really, really, really nice. Now, it might cost times 10 what you're going to sell it for, right. but it looks really pretty and it works and it's functional and, and people won't basically say, why do I see the wires hanging out of the back? Um, and so that's looking at those resources to design the, the real MVP with seemingly finished products, but not worrying so much about the cost. Thanks. Um, Grant, how developed was um, your product as you went to market and how did you figure out making it making that transition from the mvp to the commercially ready product <laughs> yeah it's a great question and you know there's the saying i i think it was reed hoffman um like if you're not embarrassed by the product you you waited too yeah. long to put it out there and, and that remains to be true today for us like like i literally an hour ago was on a call where where i was like oh we're still doing that. Like, like I thought, you know, we haven't grown past that stage. So um, I, I, I think especially in, in software, um, yeah, it's just, um, it's constantly evolving. It's never as polished as the, the user or we would, would like, but it's an iterative process. And I think um, both Dean Howard and, and Arnav touched on this, um, you know, the speed aspect and, and getting more data points really matters. So even if it's not the, the straight line linear path, like uh, not waiting too long, and then getting to make a number of like small reversible changes and in sort of, um, uh, I guess, maximize the number of learnings. Um, another way to say that is maximize the number of mistakes, but minimize the impact of them and, and then kind of iterate from there. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I wish we had a polished product that, that I could describe today. It's certainly more polished than it was before. And, um, you know, being in the, the machine learning um, field, you know, you often hear it described as, you know, some mix of art and science. And I remain very thankful that I got in in the early days when it was more art than science. Uh, we've hired a number of like very brilliant uh, PhDs who, who are just like amazing at this stuff now that we've kind of gotten to where it's more of a science and, and pin that down. In the early days, it was, um, you know, if you, if you don't have any loans on which to, to train your machine learning model, you don't have any training data, you got to get pretty creative. And, and that was an artistic fun process, but uh, you know, monthly, I find myself uh, a little bit embarrassed of some of the decisions I made or, or had to make back in 2015 when, when we were in earlier days. Well, apparently it all worked out. Um, okay, so last question, because I know that uh, we're, um, we're getting to the end of our time, but, but 
but Arnav, you went from spinning out of the university to an exit to a, basically a strategic buyer within two years. How did you do that morph process from kind of that prototype to something that was ready for acquisition? Um, again, uh, you know, Grant's point, statistical anomaly, not the, you know, not, not the <laughs> usual trend. Uh, very, very much want to highlight these things. Um, um, all, all projects, whether it be startups or some other kind, they take time. Um, this was about two or three years of spatiotemporal analytics research at the university. Um, then we went through understanding, having, you know, a sort of a wave of commercial need followed by um, a couple of years as a company. So I wouldn't necessarily think of this as just the two years. I would I would want to add, you know, the, the few years that, uh, um, in, and university-led startups have that secret, you know, um, behind them is that, you know, they have this uh, foundational work of three or four years or two or three years of iteration uh, that they're doing on that side too. Um, so that's one thing. And the other one is uh, we, we got lucky from the perspective of, we were solving exactly the problem that someone else wanted solved as an exit. But um, just to sort of touch on uh, what both uh, Dean Howard and uh, Grant mentioned is um, that the ability to build something immediately has actually, you know, is, is actually the main thing is the iteration. Um, that's what you should be optimizing for, right? Is because from a scientist's perspective, all you're trying to do is collect as much information from the market that this is something that people need, right? And this is worth doing. And then the other part is to actually solve this problem. Those are the two things. And so um, some of it was just to have this very aggressive um, 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 sort of intent um, to, to iterate as fast as possible. If there is an assumption that we had, what is the cheapest way to test that assumption um, and test that hypothesis and, and then move on, right? And, and uh, build that flywheel of uh, constant hypothesis testing. Um, and uh, that's something that we did and we had to, I mean, you know, in startup world, it's called pivoting really hard a lot of times and so on. Uh, but that that very aggressive mentality needs to exist um, for a very good reason, because this is, you know, time is the only one thing that you, know, that you cannot get back. And so that's that's one of the places where uh, the aggressive iteration is probably one simplest way to answer that. Well, I appreciate you talking a little bit about what you did before you spun out, because as I forget who said it, but it took them a decade to become an overnight success. I think that's kind of, you know, what, uh, you know, we all see the fabulousness and um, we all know that it takes a lot of hard work to get where you all are. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have, we have to do this again because I have a million questions I'd like to ask all of you, but um, for now we're done. I'm going to turn it over to Julia. Thank you, Cheryl, and thank you all of our panelists and uh, for this very interesting and I feel <laughs> I was told this is a rock star panel uh, and we had 85 people listening in, which is great for a Friday night when we all have spring fever here on Zoom. Uh, we are going to just move right into the event. Uh, come back to this room, which if you're in the gather space for Show Ohio, uh, we're going to return here at 730. We're gonna have some presentations also, all of you watching, your chance to vote uh, a Buckeyes Choice Award. That is, we have 20 presenters in booths in this gather space. Please go check them out, talk to them. Uh, the, other, the other voting is a photo booth award. So if you go into the main lobby, you'll see our photo booth, jump in, take a picture of yourself, show off a bow tie, uh, and that will be on our galleries. We're gonna vote on those as well. In between now and then, check out games in the lounge, maker stations in the lobby, mini presentations in this auditorium, and be sure to, to meet somebody new. This is a pretty cool event that we're able to do it virtually and not uh, geolocated to Columbus and stuck here. So pretty cool to take advantage of this opportunity. Also, thank you to all of our Ohio State alumni. This event would not be possible without the support of the Ohio State Alumni Association. Uh, the help of the Keenan Center for Entrepreneurship, the Innovation Studio, and thank you to the OHIO team, Matthew Errors, our student leader, Cal, our um, event manager, and OHIO program coordinator, and the rest of our student leaders. So thank you very much. Have fun.
And if I can add one more thing real quick, uh, if you did not get a chance to check in at one of our check-in desks, there are three of them in the lobby area of the space. So if you did not get a chance to check in, please go ahead and stop by one of those desks on your way out of the auditorium and have a great time at the event. Thank you, everybody. Hi there, I'm Jen, and I have 14 different health problems. One of those people is, I had 15 911 calls in three weeks. That wasn't what I needed, but the people around me didn't know that. Those trips cost me time, money, and challenged my independence. I felt helpless, voiceless. So I wrote a document that explained my situation and how to help me, and sent it to all my professors. I didn't have a single unwanted 911 call my senior year. My problem highlighted a broader problem in our emergency response system. Every medical event is different. Some people need 911 ASAP, others just need time or an emergency contact. But if anything was going to change, bystanders needed a way to know the difference. My document grew into a patent pending mobile wearable device, highly customizable and sharing only relevant information. It engages willing bystanders and guides them through giving the simple care I need when I need it, even when I can't speak for myself, like this. Hi, my name is Jen. I may be having a medical event. Please do not call 911 yet. Open the camera on your phone, aim it at the icon on my watch, click the link, and answer the questions to know how to help me. strives to make the times between a medical event, a 911 call, and an ambulance trip far more effective. It empowers users to go out in the world, to work, and to school. Help us give people the tools, not just to get by, but to thrive. The world can absolutely be a better place for it. Hi, viewers. I wanted to take a moment and talk about my first book, Analyze It, a fun and easy introduction to software analysis in the information technology industry. A middle schooler's guide to software analysis, Analyze It is a fun and engaging read for the innovators of tomorrow. Readers will join my main character, Marla, her teachers and her classmates as they use teamwork, curiosity and innovation to get their class on an amusement park field trip. In that process, these kids will learn foundational aspects of technology development, testing and deployment, as well as how to identify and solve problems. Readers will also practice talking the talk of software analysis while discovering how technology is defined, built, and managed. Throughout the book, you as the, as the reader will get the chance to read the Analyze It story, participate in guiding and activity questions, read recommended resources for parents, become comfortable with key terms, and utilize a companion guide to support the Analyze It story. An easy and entertaining read, Analyze It makes learning information technology fun and approachable for readers of all ages. Analyze It will be available on January 30th, 2021 through Amazon, my website, www.kristenbelliot.com and other book distributors. I hope you'll consider purchasing Analyze It and enjoy reading it as well. Thank you. Hi, this is the Tinkerers, and we made the Roadster. How it works is it has passive uh, collision detection system where if it gets too close on the left side, on either the side or the two legs, the left LED will blink. If you get too close behind you, both LEDs flash and a buzzer. And if anything gets too close to the right side, the right LED blinks. And if the sound is getting too much for you, or the lights, you can activate Do Not Disturb. And the lights and the buzzer will not activate, but you can still alert any passerbys. While designing and building the passive collision detection system, aka the Roadster, we encountered several roadblocks. 
The first and most significant was incorporating two LED outputs, a speaker, the do not disturb switch, the horn button, and seven ultrasonic sensors all integrated into one Arduino board. Initially, we struggled to find enough digital input output pins on the Arduino to incorporate the 18 pins required. To overcome this, we wired three of the ultrasonic sensors to the analog inputs and rewrote the RXTX serial pins to act as outputs for the LEDs. By combining what we learned while debugging our code and our knowledge of circuits, the team was able to figure out how to add two new features, the do not disturb switch and the horn, thereby lowering the number of potential common wheelchair collisions. In the future, we plan to add a vibration feedback system on each armrest, a rear view camera with live video feed, and an active collision prevention system using accelerometers and motors to move the chair away from potential collisions autonomously. Hi, we're Blubber Bread Annihilation Drill, and today we chose to solve the ICU hand sanitizing problem. We're here to talk to you about our project, Clean Hands, We Demands. With hospital-acquired infections accounting for over 100,000 deaths every year, ensuring that people go into ICUs with clean hands could save lives. Our solution is simply elegant, taking advantage of something we are starting to see everywhere thanks to the pandemic, hand sanitizing dispensers. Hand sanitizer dispensers aren't uncommon, featured outside of most stores. They are, however, often overlooked, blending into the background. Our solution aims to solve that. You put a sensor on the dispenser and a sensor on the door. Ideally, someone would use the dispenser, clean their hands, and then touch the door, and all would be well. But if someone decides to open the door without sanitizing, bam, we kill them on the spot. Okay, so that might be a little extreme. So instead of murder, our idea instead opts for flashing a message on the screen attached to the door. We didn't want it to be some stuffy, please wash your hands, because people would start ignoring that very quickly. Instead, by giving the messages some more flavor, they become harder to forget. Now, given the constraints of our situation, we had to scale things down. Instead of a big screen on the door, we have a little baby LCD, and the buttons are force sensors attached to the Arduino. Our code does two key things. It ensures that the, that the hand sanitizer is used before the door is opened, lest the user be prompted with some choice words, and it tracks how many times people use the hand sanitizer and then open the door, and how many times people ignore the messages and just open the door. This data can be stored away so that officials can monitor how compliant people are with the system. We. We here at Blubber Bread Annihilation Drill hope that our little solution can cause big changes in healthcare. The tools to keep our hands sanitized already exist. All that needs to change is a system that gets people to actually use them. By giving those who forget to hand sanitize disparaging messages, we create a system that encourages cleanliness without compromising privacy or requiring changes to existing infrastructure. So it kind of all started, uh, you know, just walking around a couple tailgates and seeing, um, you know, all the different generators that people had out and the noise and the smell that they were all making. And, you know, we kind of put our heads together and just got creative with it and said, um, well, what if you were to offer it as a service? What, would you, what if you were to bring the batteries to the people? So how does energy storage as a service work? First, people need energy. And Electrion makes it easy for users to order their mobile battery packs. They simply tell us what devices they need to power, when they need it, and where they want it delivered. Because sustainability is our top priority, we deliver our batteries using zero emission electric bikes. 
Once the user is verified by our driver, they simply connect their devices and activate the battery pack using their phone. It's that easy. Not only do, as a team, do we um, wish for this to expand into the community, into um, other events or roadside assistance, but I think one of the um, amazing aspects of Electrion is our education and outreach initiative, where we are providing the service, but also educating people about the service and why it's so important. So I feel like knowledge is power, and providing the people in our community with this knowledge will just better everybody so we can, you know, leave the world better than we found it. So I didn't have as much exposure to sustainability going through my elementary, and middle school, and high school. So now that I have it, you know, why would I hold on to that and not expose other people to that? According to the National Center of Biotechnology Information, the interior of the car is one of the filthiest places an average person comes in contact with daily. This is especially prevalent in the steering wheel, one of the most high contact areas of a car and can put the driver at risk, exposing them to harmful bacteria. Despite this, only 32% of car owners regularly sanitize their cars. This is a problem, especially apparent during the COVID-19 pandemic, where sanitizing surfaces has become a necessity. The use of UVC lights have long been researched as a potential disinfectant. During the pandemic, devices utilizing UVC lights have been employed on airlines through portable wands and lamps. According to the American Journal of Infection Control, UVC lights can potentially remove up to 99.7% of coronavirus on a sample surface within 30 seconds. However, this method of sanitizing has not been well developed for personal vehicles, which we feel is an untapped market that can be used for useful for such technology, especially in such a crucial time. To address this problem, we have created a device called the In-Vehicular Sanitizing System, the IVSS. This concept originated in the Make Ohio 2021 competition and was awarded the most original idea and placed as a top 10 finalist. This device is a compact UV sanitizer that can be used to sanitize the steering wheel before and after the user is in the vehicle. It is targeted towards frequent drivers, rental car users, and rideshare services as it can save time and ensure the safety of the driver. The device will be attached on the steering wheel in a non-invasive fashion, traversing the steering wheel when it's activated. As the IVSS is traversing the wheel, a UVC light will shine on the wheel, disinfecting the surface. IVSS will activate automatically as soon as the driver exits the vehicle to decrease the driver's exposure to the UV. Future work will focus on miniaturization of the electronic compatibility with different types of steering wheels and improved automation. In addition, we will focus on implementation of an actual UV light within the system, as well as a necessary protection against the effects on the users. Hello there, and welcome to Otter Jobs. Otter Jobs is a new platform looking to revolutionize the way that contracting works and how we can connect people within our communities. One of the main goals of Otter Jobs is to break down barriers. Ruth, a pensioner, is one of the personas that we used when we were thinking of how we would revolutionize contracting work. Imagine that Ruth is a pensioner it's the COVID pandemic and she can't really leave her house at all to do anything. What we do is we make it so that Ruth can be connected to people in her community when she needs a job in plumbing, she needs to have her roof replaced, anything she really needs, even if she needs dog sitting, she can go on to our app, place an order with a local contractor and have that taken care of her. And that's really what we're about, making sure that Ruth is being taken care of. Another thing that we do is we try to build stronger communities through our product. There's a lot of ways that we can help people. One of them is that it'll make new jobs by making it easier for people to start contracting work. It connects people in the community when people need help. And it also makes online ordering safer and easier. Our story started with the Ohio Hackathon. What we did was we created an app that would allow people to be connected through text to each other. We thought more about this problem. We thought that a web application might be a better approach, and that's how Otter Jobs was born. Here we can see an example of what our UI looks like will be coming to you in late 2021.
Attention current and former students. Do you remember how you felt the last time you had to write a paper for school? If you were like most students, you were probably somewhere between this and this. Everything about a paper seems overwhelming at the beginning. Just the thought of having to find sources, take quality notes on them, turning those notes into a paper, and then the dreaded citations all add up to you procrastinating and feeling overwhelmed. Well, my name is Zach Graber, and my company, Opendemia, is trying to fix this problem that myself, my team, and many of you are tired of having. Opendemia is a website that makes it easy to keep notes organized, automates the in-text citation and full works cited process, and saves it all for future use. Here's a 15-second snapshot of what we do. Create folders for each assignment and add sources. We auto-generate the citation for you. Then we help you take notes, keep track of when you use them, and give you the in-text citations. Finally, we output the full work cited and save all the info in case you ever need it for another assignment. In short, you hate getting writing assignments, and we help you complete them more quickly and easily. Plus, being able to do research and write effectively is important no matter the career path you choose. We want everyone to feel like they can become an expert in anything they are interested in. Thank you. All right. People who suffer from sleep apnea have increased mortality and may struggle with daytime sleepiness, but yet the cost, access, and discomfort of sleep tests discourage sleep apnea diagnoses even in the developed world. An estimated 82% of people with sleep apnea are not diagnosed in part because patients can wait over a year for a sleep test in the US, and many sleep tests are uncomfortable and expensive. The lack of sleep specialists and unnecessary entanglement with the healthcare system increases the cost of sleep diagnosis while patients remain undiagnosed. The solution to this is Sleepalyzer, a direct-to-consumer apnea diagnosis device that is cheap, easy to use, and designed for the patient. The efficient design, such as the respiratory belt for example, enables cheap and comfortable diagnosis. Patients buy Sleepalyzer online or at a pharmacy section and can analyze their sleep that very same night. In the morning, sleep data can be accessed from the user's phone and may be sent to the physician if needed. The soft respiratory belt, adjustable finger sensor, and low profile embedded system enable a comfortable sleep for all users. Each part is selected for optimal comfort and cost while being accurate for sleep apnea diagnosis. Sleepalyzer puts the patient's health back into their hands. Its low price and over-the-counter access makes it a convenient apnea diagnosis product for everyone. No doctor required. If you have questions or concerns, sleep data is always available to be sent securely to trusted physicians. Take back the night with Sleepalyzer.
100,000 people die every year in the United States due to hospital infections. Many of these could be prevented with proper hand hygiene. Currently, hand washing initiatives in ICUs have not yet reached the goal of 95% compliance to health guidelines. The SUDBUD device is a friendly alert system to promote proper hand hygiene. This ICU hand washing recognition system combines practical visual alerts with Wi-Fi tracking of hospital-wide hand washing compliance in a compact and easy to implement system. The SUDBUD employs the use of an ultrasonic sensor to detect movements around the sink. The LED ring then flashes white as a reminder to wash hands when entering and leaving the room. The LCD screen also outputs a reminder to wash and when the sink valve is turned on. In this case, with a foot pedal, the LED ring will begin timing the hand washing and reach fully green when 20 seconds has passed, which is the CDC recommended minimum. This will result in a cycle completion signal that gets sent via Wi-Fi to a backend server. If the sink is turned off within 20 seconds, the LEDs flash red and a fail signal is sent to the server. In the back end, data is processed and will be displayed on a web page to track overall compliance trends.
All right, hello and welcome back to the stage. I hope everybody had a chance to meet each presenter and get your photo taken and meet some new people and make some great connections. And I definitely saw some great blinky bow ties all over the place. So um, thank you for, for rocking those and really making that fun. Um, so let's take a minute to award Show Ohio's Best Dressed Guest. Uh, what we're going to do here is we are going to show some pictures here on our presentation like that and let's see we have one two and three here and then are these the only three yes these are the only three so we just opened up a zoom poll to uh, vote for that so if you could please vote that would be great and while we take a moment to do that, I just want to take a second to thank our partners uh, from the Innovation Studio, Keenan Center, and the Ohio State Alumni Association. Uh, if it weren't for them, we would not have been able to put on such a great event this evening and curate the experience for all of you. Um, and so uh, that was also how we sent the lovely gift from Land Grant and OHIO. Um, so can we please get a short round of applause? sorry, round of applause for all the presenters that have worked so hard and uh, have created wonderful technology innovations that impact our world and in many cases change lives. And here's our virtual round of applause. All right. For the duration of the evening, we're going to be hearing from our top five presenters and wrap up with the awards. So presenters, when your name is called, if you could please raise your hand in the webinar so that you can unmute and elevate you to presenter, that would be wonderful. So we're going to get started with the first of our presenters. We have Data Anchor with Emra Coxall. Oh, and before I forget. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know why the echo. It's definitely not because of me, I think. Are you muted and gather? Yes. Maybe everybody else can mute. Uh, okay, I think it's better now. Okay, awesome. Um, so, uh, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Give me a second. Can you see the screen right now? Yes, we can. Awesome. So uh, this is uh, Emre Coxel. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm the founder and CEO of Data Anchor. I'm also a professor of uh, electrical and computer engineering at Ohio State University. Before OSU, I was uh, uh, with MIT for grad school. Uh, my passion and our passion as the team is to make, uh, uh, you know, difficult problems simple, to come up with simple solutions to very difficult problems. So, and Data Anchor was an effort toward making data security simple. So just a quick background, we are a mature technology. We have been working on it at, uh, at my lab uh, for many years now, but the business is relatively young. We have been founded in 2019, and uh, right now we are revenue generated. And in fact, we have uh, 33 executed contracts uh, across partnerships, uh, including Vox, Ignite, and various uh, uh, others, uh, as well as uh, businesses in healthcare, manufacturing, finance, and DOD. We have been uh, selected for the $950 million ABMS program for US Air Force. And we have won uh, several awards, including uh, CRN Tech Innovator, uh, Columbus Business First, Inventor of the Year, and so on and so forth. And we still have uh, our funding round open, and we have quite a bit of interest uh, thus far to it. So uh, what's the problem that we are solving at Data Anchor? So uh, if you look at the uh, information revolution, one of the things that we have achieved is to make things simple. W what do I mean by that? We can access the data, consume data, you know, share data, and replicate it without any friction, right? So it's great. We have achieved that really nicely. But now the problem is we started doing business. In fact, all of business with data. So uh, this paradigm implies that access to data 
is equivalent to ownership of the data. So this poses a problem, as I said, when you do business with the data, because uh, you cannot control internal and external spread of data. And once you lose data, it is terrible. It's a mess. And in fact, as a result, uh, uh, government is pushing compliance requirements, which are extremely complicated to address this issue. Nevertheless, we have see, we are seeing everyday uh, problems such as solar winds attacks. The problem is not just because of external attackers, but internal uh, uh, players are adversarial as well. And furthermore, with COVID, now there is a significant fraction of the workforce working remotely, which only amplify the problem. Okay. So what have we been doing about it, uh, uh, you know, in the old paradigm? We have been building castles around our networks. We have organization networks. We have been protecting those networks and pushing our partners and employees to access the data only inside the network. But in the existing paradigm, this, uh, uh, you know, in the existing world, this doesn't work because data is distributed, access is distributed. Not only is this unnatural, but it doesn't work. I mean, look at the solar winds attack. Now your data is actually commodity. You have to assume that and act accordingly. So we need a data-centric solution. So what data-centric solution means, you have to make security an intrinsic part of your data and it has to travel with data. And that's exactly what we do in a simple fashion at Data Anchor. So it starts with encryption, but it doesn't end with encryption. It's not the end goal. We use encryption and key management to achieve full control and uh, protection of the data. We make it such that security travels with the data perpetually to all the derivatives of it as the organizations desire. While it's persistent, it's at the same time transparent and simple okay, for the internal players and legitimate users. Our patent pending technology bakes governance rules into uh, how we manage the keys, which means we can enforce very sophisticated governance rules, such as based on geographies, based on connectivity or active directory via strong encryption, very simply with one click, okay? What happens if somebody breaks the rules? Instant revocation happens even after the fact. So we have the ability to revoke access even after the fact, and we are, creating real-time audit logs, which is also very important for compliance. This includes physical location of the access. And in one sentence, Data Anchor empowers organizations to control all their data, no matter where it's created or consumed. Okay, so what's the impact of this on businesses? So businesses retain control of their sensitive data, even when it's shared or internally uh, uh, consumed. Compliance is simplified, uh, monitoring of real-time audit logs is achieved. And because of all of the above, we are a great solution for remote workforce, not only for remote workforce, but for any situation, okay? And we achieve all of this with very low ever overhead and simplicity is our thing, okay? So uh, lastly, you know, uh, but not the least, uh, we have a, uh, an amazing team uh, you know, my team members, Hari and Eric are here. Our strength is development and product. We are all technical team. Uh, you know, we have been working together for a long time right now and we create amazing technologies, build amazing futures. And lately we have been expanding the business side as well. So, uh, you know, we are adding amazing experience on the business side lately as well. So uh, this is all I have to say, please. Uh, uh, I'm opening the floor for questions. Thank you. Um, that was awesome. Can you um, get back control of the screen real quick so we can continue on? Okay, sorry about that. No, no, it's fine. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, you guys are doing great work. Um, we are going to take a second to drop a poll into the chat for the Buckeye Choice Award. This award is for all the presentations that you're seeing right now, the top five, in addition to all 20 presenters total for the evening. So as you had time to go through and take a look at um, the presenter booths and see what was going on, this is to give an award to one of those people. You guys get to choose 
what your favorite is. So go ahead and um, hit the link in the chat, vote for your favorite, and at the very end, we will tally up all the results um, and let you guys know who was the favorite. Matthew, that's all you. All right. Uh, so while they are voting for that, um, I do want to announce before our next presenter that the cat won best dressed in our photo booth contest. So congratulations to the cat. <laughs> and next up, we are going to have uh, TRC with Caitlin Swindle Riley. So Caitlin, I will go ahead and promote you here. And there we go. Hi, I'm Caitlin Swindle Riley, and I'm excited to speak to you today on behalf of Itrenew. I am very passionate about developing new materials and drug delivery systems to help treat and prevent blindness. I'm an assistant professor here at Ohio State in biomedical and chemical engineering, as well as ophthalmology. I also serve as chief technology officer of Vitrenu, a startup company that licensed my ocular drug delivery technologies from Ohio State. As you can see, Vitrenu has assembled quite an accomplished team. Our CEO, Gordon Bethwaite, is an eye care industry veteran with over 20 years of commercial ophthalmology experience. Chief Operating Officer Brian Jones has extensive experience with drug device combinations, with antibody therapeutics, and with extended release formulations, which are all relevant to the design of our extended release capsule. We have Brian Price, Director of CMC, with over 20 years of experience in product development, CMC, quality control, and regulatory compliance. This team is also rounded out by Cohen Benner, Dr. Matthew Orr. He's an Ohio State professor and chief medical officer of the team. He's also a vitreoretinal surgeon who treats patients with these types of injections to prevent blindness. Unfortunately, all of us at some point will experience age-related vision loss. Many diseases are managed or treated by frequent injections, particularly in the eye. Vitrenu has decided to focus on the third leading cause of blindness because it has no cure. Age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, will affect 30% of people by the age of 75. And patients can only maintain their vision by getting monthly injections of anti-VEGF straight into their eye for the rest of their lives. This treatment regimen incurs huge costs, and it's a burden to the patients, to the caregivers, and to the healthcare system. There are over half a million injections that are performed every month. It is clear that the number one unmet need in this area is extended release to reduce that injection frequency. We have developed drug delivery technology with the goal of reducing the number of patient visits and improving their treatment outcomes. We can prepare these tunable extended release capsules or TERPs, and as you can see here, they're smaller than a grain of rice. These biodegradable TERPs are made of FDA approved components by some novel materials processing steps. We can fine tune the Turks to sustain the release anywhere from six to 12 months by modulating the porosity. The nature of these Turks also helps to maintain the bioactivity for these expensive therapeutics long-term. This is a significant improvement over the current treatment of monthly injections that's required for AMD. We are currently raising seed funds to support preclinical studies for FDA approval via the 505B2 pathway. We require $3 million and 18 months for IND enabling studies, and our preclinical work will focus on establishing the safety of our capsule, as well as pharmacokinetics and efficacy in conjunction with the currently used therapeutics. Vitrenu's initial target is delivery of pre-approved biologics for treatment of AMD. Our future directions include delivery of other molecules to the eye via intravitreal injection. 
Since the first anti-VEGF treatment was introduced 15 years ago, the need for this extended duration of effect has been recognized as a major, major need by strategic players in the space. Major pharmaceutical companies looking to protect, grow, or establish a market presence are actively seeking these drug delivery technologies. Our end goal is licensing or acquisition by a major pharmaceutical company, primarily in the ophthalmic space. This is a large and established $12 billion global market and it's growing at 8% CAGR. We have the technology at Vitrenu to fulfill the number one need of decreasing injections to only one or two times per year. Vitrenu has the potential to deliver best in class extended release platform based on our IP portfolio. Our unique Turk offers tunable, predictable drug release while being biodegradable and protecting the activity of the therapeutic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, right. Caitlin. That was wonderful. Yeah, Does thank anybody you so have much. any questions? Nope. Okay, Matthew, it's all you. All right. Next up, we have Xenia Dillon with her innovative cancer treatment. Uh, and Xenia, if you want to raise your hand, we can go ahead and get you up here. There you are. And uh, Caitlin, if you want to stop sharing your screen, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And I think we are Almost good to go. If you're free to share your screen whenever you're ready. I can do that. Can everybody hear me? Or somebody just needs to tell me that they can. Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Uh, can I get started? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, perfect. Good evening, everyone. My name is Xenia Call. I did my Cancer Genetics Fellowship at the Ohio State Medical Center. I also graduated from the Fisher College of Business with an MBA in 2016. That's when we started Reheva Biosciences, actually, with one of the, uh, at the time, professors who was also my co-founder and executive chairman. His name is Bill Diffendiffer. Some of you may know him uh, from his days at Skybus Airlines. He was the CEO. Uh, along with him and some of the talented team that we have right now, we actually started Reheva Biosciences. So Reheva is, is a unique company which is developing a novel pharmaceutical for cancer treatment. So the lead compound that we're working on is RS324. Our progress so far, we have investigational new drug uh, allowance from the FDA. What that means is that we're allowed to do clinical trials. We are gearing up to start our phase one clinical trial in cancer patients at university hospitals in Cleveland. So far, we've already developed a GMP clinical trial drug. What that means is the highest standard which is available to develop to manufacture drugs. We have raised up to $3.2 million in friends and family in Series A, and I always proudly say it was all Ohio-based investors. We have a significant data um, on the safety of the drug that we are currently pursuing in clinical trials. Uh, we are currently starting to look funds for doing phase two trials, which is the efficacy trials, meaning that whether does this drug work in humans, those are the trials that we will be conducting soon and to grow the team further. As I said, we are a small team, but a very talented one with very big ambitions. We have some of the leaders in the regulatory affairs here. Um, one of the, some of the leaders who conduct clinical trials, um, some of the names are Parexel. Uh, Charles River Laboratory does the safety work for us. And we have some clinical partners, Ohio State is one, University Hospitals, and we're working with some of the leading researchers in developing this drug further. So the problem that we're trying to solve here is the long-term cancer treatment and trying to delay that reoccurrence 
in, in the longer time period here. Um, unfortunately, a lot of us here in the room may be affected by some friend or family who's gone through cancer treatment. And what happens is after you finish your cancer treatment, there's a time where um, your doctor tells you you're in remission. That means that we cannot detect the cancer through the medium or through the technologies which is available to us. But after a certain time and certain cancers, uh, maybe most will actually reoccur during the lifetime sometime. But what we are proposing is a long-term solution to cancer treatment in a single pill formation. So what I'm showing you here is our lead compound RSV24 combining with the standard of care and once you hit that remission, you continue taking RS324 because it will slow down tumor growth. It is safe over a long period of time and has the efficacy to continue this. And hopefully we will push the re reoccurrence time out in the future. So what are the requirements for a long-term cancer treatment? It should reduce tumor growth. It should reduce or slow down metastases. That means it's not spreading to other parts of the body minimal side effects so that you can continue taking it long term. One of the drawbacks of the most of the current chemotherapy is because it has side effects and we cannot continue taking it for a long period of time. Safety over long time, relatively lower cost so that we can afford it over a long period of time. And the ease of administration in the patients, preferably older so that we don't have to go to the infusion centers every three weeks, high cost, very time consuming efforts there. And fortunately, our RS324 actually checks a lot of those, in fact, all of those boxes for us. So what is RS324? RS324 is a naturally derived treatment. Interestingly, more than 40% of chemotherapy that's currently being used in cancer clinics are derived or some inspiration from nature. However, we, we synthesize them synthetically. And as a result, we have a lot of side effects. RS324 has 15 years of discovery and identification of a unique plant seed line with a unique chemical signature, which is only toxic to cancer cells and leaves the healthy cells alone. Its addition to standard of care increases the anti-tumor and tolerability to standard of care, and our long-term safety profile really allows us to use this drug for a long period of time. We have actually, as I said, it's a unique plant and we've actually taken a lot of the advantages and the advancements made in the controlled environment work to grow our plants. So we are actually growing our plants in large scales. We are scaling up to large scales uh, in, in controlled environments to, to actually have that lot to lot consistency, which is required for pharmaceutical drugs. As an outcome, what we hope is, and this is a, for no particular cancer, but this solid line, imagine this is a typical aggressive cancer where the probability of reoccurrence basically starts peaking at a certain amount of time. What we are hoping is by taking RS324 alongside with the alongside with your standard of care, we will reduce that probability and also further push it out in time so that the patient has a longer life or disease-free progression as we like to call it in the industry. RS324 has multiple indications. Currently, we are pursuing non-small lung cancer. We have a lot of data to support soft tissue sarcomas and ovarian cancer as well. And uh, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. Uh, if you, I, I assume we're not taking too many questions here, but if you do have any questions, please reach out to me uh, through any of the organizers or my email addresses here. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, that was a really great presentation. And next up we have Electrion with Anita and Jacob. Awesome. And you guys are good to start presenting. And I think we can confirm that we can hear you. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> cool. Hi, I'm Anita, and I am CEO of Electrion. And our other two team members are um, Danny Fredinger. He's our chief technology officer. And then as well as Caleb, um, he is our chief strategy officer. And I'm Jacob Waffle, and I am the chief innovative officer here at Electrion. So let's get right into it. What is Electrion? Electrion provides turnkey mobile energy storage services and solutions. Um, energy storage as a service or ESAS is what we call it for short. So there's really two problems that our solution aids. The first problem is just with the high cost of batteries, there is not really an economical option for clean mobile energy. 
what do I mean by this? Um, if we have a tailgate, as an example, um, people uh, bring generators that um, emit a lot of CO2. And while there are eco-friendly solutions, sometimes it can be between three to five times the normal cost for a generator. The second issue is automotive companies spend a lot of money to recycle battery packs that have a very high usable capacity, sometimes up to 80%. So our solution brings these two problems together by repurposing Second Life automotive packs um, by bringing a sustainable solution. So there's really three parts to the service. People need the energy, people order the energy, and people get the energy. It's that simple. So going back to the tailgate case, um, if you get to your tailgate spot, Right, um, you whip out your phone, you hop onto the application, um, you tell us what you're gonna be powering, maybe a TV, a few crock pots and um, extension cords so everybody can charge their phone while they're watching the game. And then we deliver our product to you um, also in a sustainable option as well uh, with maybe an EV or maybe an e-bike. Okay, and now we have a very high level diagram of just how all of these moving pieces and parts come together. Um, and so a lot of our data and information is being transmitted through a cloud-based system. Um, and so from the administrative perspective, that's where we're um, push, that's where we're receiving the data or information from the users as to what exactly they need powered. Um, and then we're then communicating that information, like the location and the time in which these users need, need um, their battery modules to the drivers. Um, and then the really cool um, piece of the of our system ar architecture is the IoT component um, where we're able to communicate in real time with these battery modules and get um, incoming data on voltage and just, um, just how much output power it's having at each and every um, about 30 seconds, um, which is a very um, cool aspect because and then we are um, able to manage the safety of it as people are utilizing them in the service. Um, and then we have here how we fit into the market in terms of other energy st storage devices providers. Um, and when we have when the um, top half is companies who are offering their battery modules or energy storage devices for um, purchasing. So meaning that you could purchase these modules like um, to keep in your home, like the Tesla box. Um, you can plug have that inside of your garage and you could plug in to charge your vehicle. And then the lower half is the rental model, which is um, what we would be utilizing as well. But then as well as um, Electrion sweet spot and all of this is the fact that we're using Second Life batteries. So that's the advantage that we have over um, a lot of these companies that we're not putting new batteries into the market, but um, we're using ones that are coming out of EVs. And so we talk about our execution and strategy. Electron is all about making portable energy convenient for the everyday everyday person. Um, and so um, first starting off with kind of our, our execution points and our steps um, to um, being to getting to the eventually eventual um, scaling product would be to first identify the opportunities outside of tailgates. Um, of course, tailgates are only a couple of Saturdays in a year, but um, getting plugged into opportunities or other events like indoor events where you can't always take in your diesel generators. Um, and then two, analyzing the markets that we wanna go into um, and being able to do just a, a quick market analysis on that and how we would, how Electron would impact that specific market. And then three, operations and logistics. Um, batteries can be very dangerous um, and hazardous. So um, going through the process of getting our UL certification, which is essentially the standard in which um, uh, battery mod modules or energy storage devices like ours would have to go through in order to get kind of get the stamp of approval um, to be able to transport them and have um, the regular everyday person utilizing them. And then as well as four, um, our mar market performance and analysis um, and getting really getting into the testing model of our product, um, beta testing, customer reviews and product service quality, um, starting to get that data and feedback back so that we know what things we need to improve upon in order to eventually get to the point of five of being able to scale these things. And our goal is to continue to target campuses that are similar to Ohio State that are near urban cities where um, we could start in the, in the universities and campuses, but then we could also scale to the surrounding communities. And this is a bit of our media coverage and that is the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. And great and rebounding our evening, we have Zephyr Bots with Achel Singhal.
And so if you would like to share your screen and get started, that would be wonderful. Hey, everyone. I assume you can hear me now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so my name is Atchel Single, and I'm the founder of Zypherbots, uh, where we aim to create the future of autonomous platforms. So drones are a newer and exciting piece of technology that is being integrated into every facet of our life, from shipping and receiving to surveillance and precision agriculture. These vehicles are expected to be a large part of our everyday routines. They're not without fault, chief among them being rotor noise, which can exceed safe limits at close distances, and poor vehicle efficiency that really limits the flight time of the vehicle. So noise and efficiency are closely tied. A drone that exerts less effort in making noise will have more energy available to fly. And as such, understanding rotor noise is a key enabler for drones. Shown in this video is my previous graduate work in Switzerland, where I was able to make a single rotor play some music. Uh, so here at Zypherbots, our goal is to use this understanding of rotor noise to reduce the overall noise signature of drones and improve rotor efficiency. Based on static testing, I've observed a decrease in the power required by 20%, so now your vehicles can fly longer, and a noise reduction of 20 decibels while maintaining the rotor thrust. A 20 decibel noise reduction is akin to going from uh, an alarm clock that wakes you up in the morning to a conversation that you might have with your friends. Um, and this improvement is also expected to scale well with vehicle size, making it viable outside of the drone space. However, due to the sheer funding requirements of large scale vehicles, such as air taxis, uh, first the drone delivery space will be targeted. Uh, with that being said, you might ask, why does noise really matter, right? It's, it's cool that we're able to use the reduction in noise to improve the efficiency of drones, but is that it? Um, and the short answer is no. NASA released an uh, urban air mobility study and 2018, in which only half of the surveyed were comfortable with drone operations, and noise was a major concern. My technology enable, uh, alleviates this concern and makes drones people-friendly. That's what this work is about and how it allows drones to reach their full potential in our society. So currently, there are several examples of state entities and potential customers using drones for delivery services, including the city of Reno, the Memphis Shelby Airport, and the North Carolina Department of Transportation. The, city, the state of Ohio is actually standing up its own testing bed for drone delivery and plans to uh, create a drone highway between its major cities. And I think this shows that this is a growing field. NASA expects drones to deliver about half a billion packages in 2030, and Morgan Stanley Research estimates that the UAM market will be valued at 1.5 trillion US dollars in 2040. As a growing market, it is difficult to project the, drone, the market share a drone manufacturer would have. However, we can use the current aviation industry as a parallel. Um, currently, uh, a, aircraft manufacturers, uh, Boeing and Airbus, share about 17% of this industry's value. And using this number and the predicted value of the global civilian market in 2040, UAM manufacturers would share about a quarter trillion dollar of revenue by 2040, thus making even a small venture uh, have significant value. Um, and as a new company, the first phase milestone is to create a functional and flight tester prototype that can be used as a demonstrator for customer engagement efforts during the subsequent year. The second phase milestones are to go through the patent process, uh, both domestic and international, and then to uh, engage with customers directly to determine requirements for a certified product that will be delivered at the end of our second phase. Uh, strategic partnerships will also be uh, explored during this phase and Mass manufacturing, when needed, will be contracted out using the existing manufacturing infrastructure right here in Columbus, Ohio. Currently, I'm at the end of the, my concept phase, so I have a lab-tested idea and a simulated integration that will need to be made into a uh, functional prototype before advancing into an actual product, uh, which is 
the goal of phase two. Currently, we're seeking uh, 400K from investors to support our phase one efforts. And upon demonstration of the technology, an additional 2.6 million will be needed to support product development efforts. Uh, the phase one funding will allow me to hire the necessary staff and purchase the necessary supplies and uh, rent the necessary space to build and test a, a flying vehicle. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for their time and their ears, and I'm um, happy to take any questions or feel free to email me at this email address. All right, thank you so much, Achel, for your presentation. And uh, thank you so much for your hard work. Uh, if anyone wants to learn any more information about these presenters, their information will be available on our Show Ohio website. Feel free to hang out and gather for the evening. Uh, you have access to the space until 11 p.m. Eastern time. And before we uh, end the presentation, I want to announce the Buckeye Choice Award. So uh, we would like to announce that Electrion is the winner of Buckeye Choice. So congratulations to everyone from Electrion. A virtual applause here. Thank you guys, appreciate it so much. Yeah. yeah, and second place we have Otter Jobs. So congratulations to Otter Jobs for second place. And our third place, and our third place is Kazmark. So congratulations to all three teams. And let's have a nice round of applause for all three teams. All right. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for your support of OHIO and for coming to Show Ohio. Uh, feel free to stick around in our space. Uh, like I said, it is open until 11 PM. And we'll be around if you have any questions. Thanks.